I'm going to go ahead and start. <clears throat> We've got so much to do. Um, we left off the other day on my last Duchess on 726 in the 11th edition and 910 in the 10th edition. I believe we left off with um, the Duke has just said line 20, line 21, page 726. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Okay? I remember it's a dramatic monologue. Speaker betrays, reveals something himself, accidentally, doesn't intend to. All right? And he's been talking about, the speaker's been talking to another person about his last duchess, whose portrait is hanging on the wall as they're making their way down the stairs. Okay? And the portrait has a, a spot of joy in the cheek, probably implying blush. Okay? And he's explained possibly why she has that spot of joy or blush. And that's why he says, she had a heart, how shall I say, too soon be glad, too easily impressed, she liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. That is, whatever she looks at, kind of makes her smile. She sees beauty and joy everywhere, right? But, the speaker says she's too easily impressed, okay? And her looks went everywhere. Sir, twas all one. Well, what's twas all one? What comes after? He's going to say, each of these things that I'm going to list, in her mind, they were all the same. They were all equally worthy of, or, or they all equally provided joy to her. Okay? So here's what he mentions. My favor at her breast. Okay? His favor is implying, or his favor is referencing like a jewel or a gem, a locket. Okay? Hanging around her neck. What else? The dropping of the daylight in the west, a beautiful sunset, all right? A bough of cherries, a the bough of cherries, some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. A little clump of cherries that some guy brings to her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace. So, the piece of jewelry I bought her, the sunset in the west, a bowl of cherries, her white mule. Each of those, all in each, would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush, at least. Okay? What's the speaker suggesting? Which of those... From the speaker's point of view, should elicit a greater response from his last duchess. Should she weigh a bowl of cherries equally with the piece of jewelry he's given her? No. She should appreciate that more than the bowl of cherries. She thanked men. Good. Shows courtesy. Shows respect. Shows good manners. All right? She thanked men. Good. But thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. What's the speaker just told us? She didn't really appreciate it. She didn't really appreciate what? Which gift? You're right. No. His nobility. His nobility. His gift of a 900 years old name. She was the Duchess. If we take the little sub, the, the name of the town at the top, 
She was the Duchess of Ferrara. A family that goes back 900 years. What does he say? As if she ranked that with what? A bowl of cherries. A sunset. The white mule. What's he revealing? What's the, what's the dark aspect of his character that is being revealed that he probably doesn't intend to reveal? What's his problem? He's jealous. He's jealous of what? Notice, he's not jealous of another person. He's jealous or angry, possibly, that she doesn't what? Excuse me. She didn't what? Properly respect him? Properly honor him? Properly whatever him? She didn't show him what he thinks he was worth. Or what he was worthy of. So what's he revealing? Kind of some narcissism? It's all about him. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? That is, who would lower himself, that's what stoop means, to blame this trif what what trifling? The trifling of her equating his nine hundred years old name with a bowl of cherries. He said, "It's unimportant. It's insignificant." But it isn't unimportant, and it isn't insignificant. Why? Because of the very fact that he mentioned it. Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one and say, just this, just this or that in you disgust me. Here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be less than so, nor plainly set her wits to yours for sooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping. So, who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling. Who would lower himself to do that? But then he says, assume for the moment that you have the ability to put into words, which I don't, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one. Honey, I don't like that you do X, Y, Z. Honey, I like that you do this, he says, and if she allowed herself to be taught so, and didn't try to set her wits against yours, no, you're wrong, here's why, okay? He says, even then, line 41, no, take that back. 42, even then, if you found the words to do all that, what? That would be some stooping. Semicolon, pause. It's a pause for dramatic effect. And I choose never to stoop. Why not? Why does he choose never to stoop? Because he's an arrogant SOB. He's too proud. Okay? So, the speakers told us he doesn't like some of the things his wife did before. How did she know that he didn't like that? She didn't. He never said anything. Because he's not going to stoop to that level. Oh, sir, she's 
smiled, no doubt, whenever I passed her. That is, when we would see each other, she would smile at me. But who passed without much the same smile? She also smat, you know, smiled at her ladies-in-waiting. She smiled at the servants. She smiled at the stable boy. His point is, she didn't do anything different for me. She didn't go more for me. This grew. What's the this? Everything he's been saying about her. The blush in the cheek caused by something I said or something somebody else did. Her smiles at all people. Her showing thanks for all things given to her. He says, this, this, this grew means this continued. And in his mind, what is that? This continued, this grew mean. It got worse and worse and worse. I gave commands. So notice, this grew, semicolon. I gave commands, semicolon. Then all, my, all smiles stopped together, period. What commands? Notice, not stupid. Are you going to say something? Well, you said what commands. Yeah. What commands did he give? Look at the next line. Then all smiles stopped together. Like an ultimatum, maybe? Did he, commit, did he give her an ultimatum? Stop smiling at people. What comes after then all smiles stopped together? There she stands as if alive. What command did he give? Jorge, go take care of the missus. Did he order her death? I think so. I think that's why she stopped smiling. She's dead. Again, he won't stoop to do what? Attempt to correct her behavior. Why? It's as if she should automatically know. Okay? Then, we start to get the reason for why this speaker is talking to the other person. Or, let me rephrase that. We start to get the reason for why the other person is there in the first place. This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you rise? In other words, they've been sitting, looking at the portrait, while he's described his last duchess. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. Do we know what the company below is yet? No, we don't. I repeat, the Count, your master's, no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. What's the purpose of their meeting? We were told it with one word. Dowry. Dowry. What's a dowry? When the uh, when woman's family pays the man. It's what the future father-in-law pays or gives to the groom. He doesn't just quote unquote give away the bride. What comes with the bride? It's a package deal. Don't have dowries anymore. Okay. Dowries pretty much died out a couple hundred years ago. So what's the purpose of the meeting? Not quite. Close though. They're going to discuss terms of a marriage. This guy is here, the person listening, is here to be one of those involved in the discussion or in the negotiation. Okay? So what has he just learned about his master's future son-in-law? Possibly. 
What has he possibly learned? He's a murderer. He's a murderer. What happened to his last wife? She's hanging there on the wall. Why? Because she didn't please him. Notice. To count your master's no munificence. What does munificence mean? Generosity. This guy is free with his money. Okay? He says, that is ample warrant that no pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. I know the count your master will give the amount I am requesting for the dowry. What's his purpose for marrying this woman? It's money. Okay? Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. But um, it's, not, it's not about the money. No, no, no. Lucia, she's what I really want. She's, oh, she's so wonderful. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Why, nay? What's happened between his fair daughter's self is my object and nay, we'll go down together, sir. See, this often happens in a dramatic monologue. The person hearing the conversation does something so that the person giving the, the poem, the person speaking it, responds. Well, the hearer has just responded. How? He gets up quickly to start going downstairs. He wants to get downstairs when? Before the speaker. Why? My lord, we need to talk. Don't marry your daughter to this guy. He said, no, 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 we'll go down together. It's almost like he grabs his hand because he knows what the other guy's thinking. No, no, I'm, you're not going to spoil this one. Mm -mm. And then he says, notice Neptune, though. Another work of art. Okay? Taming a seahorse, thought a rarity. Which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. So notice he name drops the portraitist the artist who painted the portrait of his last duchess, and he names dropped this Klaus of Innsbruck. They're both not real artists. There wasn't, there wasn't a Fra Pandolf, and there wasn't a Klaus of Innsbruck. Browning creates those. Why does the speaker do this? What is he emphasizing? What will his next duchess be for him? Bingo. He's a collector. She'll just be another piece of art. Whether she ends up as a portrait on the wall or not. What does the speaker not want? There's a movie. Not a movie based on this, but there's a movie where all this language comes out, and I can't remember what it is for the life of me. It's one of my favorite movies, too. He doesn't want what? A living, breathing, walking, talking, thinking, having her own will. Oh, that's it. Room with a view. Okay. 1980, 1982, something like that with Helena Bonham Carter playing the character of Lucy. It's based on a novel by... Ian Forster, um, oh, and I can't remember who plays the romantic lead, but she falls in love with, she's supposed to be married to this guy. The guy's name is Cecil, all right? Played by Daniel Day-Lewis, very young Daniel Day-Lewis. And she eventually breaks off the marriage because she says, you don't really love me. You don't even know what a woman is for. And she's talking about sex. She goes, you just want me for, to be a piece of art. You want to set me on your mantle. Meanwhile, she's falling in love with this other guy, you know, who does know what women are for in, within the context of the movie, okay? 
he reveals, you know, his jealousy, his anger, his murderous streak, etc. Okay, let's go from there to 740, God's grandeur. We are so far behind. I'm gonna I'm gonna send a video of a couple of previous lectures that'll have some of the poems that we're not gonna get to. Um, God's grandeur, 740. Gerard Manley Hopkins, Catholic priest. At this point in time, 19th century, it's okay to be a Catholic priest in, in England. The laws against you know anti-Catholicism and all that kind of stuff died out in the 17th century. God's grandeur, that's what this part right here is. Okay. If we get to this stuff, we'll talk about it. God's grandeur is a son. 14 line poem <coughs> written according to the Italian or Petrarchan sonnet structure. All right? And what that means is it has an octave and a sestet. Octave, first eight lines. And then the sestet, the last six lines. Between the octave and the sestet, you get what's called a volta, a turn, a change of emphasis, a change of direction, sometimes a, um, a contradiction, a contrariness implied. Okay, And it has the rhyme scheme of A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, that is the first eight lines rhyme like that, and then the last six lines, C, D, C, D, C, D. So, look at the poem for a moment, just look at the last word of each line. God, foil, oil, rod, A, B, B, A. Trod, toil, soil, shod, A, B, B, A. God, rod, trod, shod, A, 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 okay? And then the last six, do this. So, God's grandeur. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. Notice, short declarative sentence. Doesn't go on to the next line, it just ends right there. What's meant by charge? How do we use that term today? Louder, energize, okay? It's got something put into it. Usually we think electrical charge. <clears throat> Electricity had been around for a little while. By this point, they were using it for, you know, telegraphs and things like that. Uh, don't think Bell had invented the telephone yet. So, the world, he says, is, I like that word, energized by God. All right? It will flame out. That is, that charge will be released. Like shining from shook foil. And your gloss tells you, shaken gold foil. But we don't have to read it as gold foil. We can read it as like tin foil. Take a piece of tin foil, aluminum foil, out in the sun and shake it around and you're going to see sparkles. All right? It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. What's the it? The grandeur of God. Okay? That's what will flame out. That's what gathers to a greatness. Okay? Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Okay? And your gloss tells you, for wreck his rod, obey God. Do we ever use the verb to wreck? Today, R-E-C-K, not W-R-E-C-K. No, we don't. Do we ever use the word wreck? No, we don't. What word might we use that it's part of? Louder? Nope. Nope. Close, though. Actually, it is related to that. That's not the one I was looking for. Because that one, wreck it. Reckon, R-E-C-K-O-N. I reckon aisle, it's not used very often. It's kind of, you know, slangy, which is related to reckless. When you reckon, you think. If you're reckless, you're not thinking. 
Okay? So, why do then men, why do men then now not wreck his rod? Now, your gloss tells you, obey God. But it also means, think about God's rod. What's meant by rod? What do emperors, Caesars, kings usually have? Notice I'm doing this. Yeah. A staff. What is that staff? It's the insignia of authority, of power. Okay? Why don't they think about, consider God's authority, God's power, God's governance, all that stuff? Next stanza. Different ideas. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. What, what's the have trod? What's trod? Walk. walk. It's the past tense of to tread. Okay? They've walked, they've walked, they've walked. Why the emphasis? Been around a long time, right? It's not just... Two generations, three generations, four generations. He's going all the way back. From Adam and Eve. We walked and walked and walked and walked and walked. And all is seared with trade. Bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now. Nor can foot feel being shod. Notice from the first line of the second quatrain to the um, end of the third line and all of the fourth line, what do we go back to? First, first line about walking. The end of the third line, we have soil brought up because what do you walk on? The ground. And whether the ground is like this, we're just up above the ground, or what Peck Hall sits on. Underneath it all is what? Soil. Okay? So... I'm skipping the middle two lines for a moment. They've trod, they've trod, they've trod. The soil is bare now. Why? What happens when you walk on grass? And you keep walking on the grass. And you keep walking. <clears throat> and generations do it. You wear that grass away. You can go out to parts of the <clears throat> western parts of the country through Colorado, Wyoming, Eastern Oregon, Nebraska, and you can still see parts of the Oregon Trail where the ruts created by the Conestoga wagons okay, dug two foot deep ruts in the ground. I mean, you can actually walk the trail because so much of that is still there, all right? That's his point. We've done what? Destroyed the ground, the earth. Now go back to line two of that second stanza. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared. What's the and all? The world is seared with trade. What does seared mean? I mean, literally it means burnt. I don't necessarily know that he means literal burn, but he definitely means touched. Okay? Seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. Everything is touched by human industry, not smokestacks industry. Human activity. That's all industry really means. And where's man's smudge and shares man's smell? What is he saying? What is the speaker saying? Humanity is done to the world. <coughs> Ruined, it. Ruined it. You know, if you're an eco-warrior or an eco-terrorist, you ought to just really love, you know, Gerard Manley Hopkins. And for all this, turn, there's the volta. The for there means despite or in spite of all this, all this what? All this destruction of the natural world. Nature is never spent. What does spent mean there? What do you do when you spend your paycheck? 
hopefully you don't, but you know, we have to spend some of it. You lose it, right? You give it away. You don't keep it. It's gone. And for all this, in spite of all this, nature is never, doesn't mean give it away, means destroyed. I mean, it kind of is given away. Nature is never gone. It's never used up. Why? There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. In other words, the surface is worn. Just dig down a little deeper. And you will see the dearest freshness. And though the last lights off the black west went. So the last lights off the black west. What's the image he's talking about? Sunset. But it's not sunset like the sun has just dipped over the horizon, right? Because what color is the horizon then? Bright yellow or orange, right? So when does that west get black? Several hours later. And though the last lights off the black west went. So it's now pitch black in the west. Oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs. So when it gets blackest over here, darkest over here, what is now happening over here? It's not as black as it was. Okay. It's starting to get light. Little Orphan Annie, the sun will come up tomorrow. Why? Morning at the Brown Brink Eastward Springs? Because. Because what? Because the Holy Ghost of the bent world broods with warm, broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. Go back to the beginning of Genesis, the creation story. What does the Spirit of God do? It hovers over the face of the earth. During the creation. That's what Hopkins' speaker is getting at. No matter, the speaker is suggesting, and Hopkins threw him, no matter what we do to the world, God ultimately is still in control. The Wreck his rod. In other words, we might think we can do all this stuff, but the Holy Spirit is still, you know, at work, so to speak. Again, he's Catholic. He's going to write Catholic stuff. Uh, or Christian stuff. Um, Jabberwocky, 743. We won't spend long on. Have any of you ever read this before? Like in middle school or high school? English? It used to be taught. Um, I, I'm not going to say anything really about it other than what kind of poem is this? Twas brillig in the slithy toes to gyre and jimble in the wave all mimsy were the borogoves and the moan rats out grave. What does that mean? Nothing, right? It's nonsense. And yet... It's grammatically perfect. You've got nouns, you've got verbs, you've got adjectives, you've got prepositions, you've got conjunctions. It's almost like Lewis Carroll is inventing language. Okay? So why does he write it? The opening page, pages, about poetry talked about the fun of playing with sounds. Ice cream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream was the example given. A lot of stupid, silly rhyme there. Same kind of thing here. But what Carroll does, Lewis Carroll, also Charles Lutwich Dodson, same person. What Carroll does is he expands that. He writes entire books of nonsense. Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass where you have the Cheshire Cat and you have you know, the Queen of Hearts, etc., etc. They're all nonsense. 
But even though they're nonsense, they are, they kind of touch on here, right? So, twas brillig in the, just listen to it. Twas brillig in the slithy toes to gyre and jibble in the wave. O mimsy were the borogoves and the moan raz outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son. See, that makes perfect sense. If you know what a jabberwock is. The jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand long time, the manxum foe he sought. So tested he by the tumtum tree and stood a while and thought. And as in oofish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tolgy wood and burbled as it came. When two and two and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker snack, he left it dead and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig in the sliding. So it's pretty clear. Some kid gets a sword. It's a vorpal sword, whatever that means. And he goes off and kills the Jabberwock, whatever that is. There's an actually, there's a movie done. A movie movie done of this in the 1970s. I remember seeing it at the theaters, okay? Didn't make a lot of sense. And it was a long, I mean, it's a feature film, like 90 minutes long. So it, it all gets expanded and such. The Jabberwock is a monster, and the, I don't remember what the blade was and such. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, shall, I, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, and my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun? Okay? Shakespeare. So, uh, 780, 781 in the 11th edition, and 976 in the 10th edition. Okay? These are two of Shakespeare's sonnets. Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets. Okay? He probably, take that back, he began writing them in the mid 1590s. We know that. Uh, the sonnets were published in 1609. We have no idea if Shakespeare was responsible for the publishing of them. Okay? Um, we know he was the writer of them because they're attributed to him in that book, but we have no idea if Shakespeare was behind the publishing of the book. Right? Very, very briefly, the Shakespeare, Shakespeare sonnet sequence kind of tells a story. The story is about a speaker, a male speaker, male persona behind the palms. Don't assume it's Shakespeare. Far too many people do that, even a lot of scholars assume the speaker is Shakespeare. You shouldn't, okay? And there are two recipients and or objects of the speaker being addressed. The first one is a golden-haired youth, a young man in his 20s, who has long, curly, yellow hair, blonde, right? The second individual is Carl, is called the Dark Lady. Probably African, can't say African-American, probably African, or Northern African, okay? Has wiry, kind of kinky hair. We're going to be, we're going to hear about dark skin, etc. So, about the first 125 sonnets are directed to the golden-haired youth. So you have a male speaker talking, writing to a male friend. This is not contrary to what some critics say. This is not homoerotic love. This is not a romantic relationship between two men. This is a time period when men could speak openly of their love for each other and there's no romance, no eros involved. It's familial, excuse me, it's bromance. Bromance. Okay? Bromance. It's Guys who like to spend time together, but there's nothing sexual, right? Our century has become so screwed up because everything is now sexual. So that's about the first 125. There are some things implied in some of these that allude to this person. 
the dark lady, all right? The dark lady is the speaker of the sonnet's mistress. The speaker's sleeping with her, or had been, okay? Here's the problem. The speaker, at some point, introduces his male friend to his lover. What happens? They hook up. But then, form a relationship. These two. It's no longer just a hookup. Okay? Which means this person's kind of left out in the cold. It's not like they're having a menage a trois or a threesome or, you know, it, nothing like that's going on. So, in some of these, this person writes about this person as being false, unfaithful. You've left me for her, kind of a thing. Which is one of the reasons why some critics say, oh, it's all about sex. Because he doesn't equate that with sex. Okay? The first 20 poems are addressed, these are all addressed to the golden-haired youth. All right? And what the speaker is saying in the first 20 poems, first 19, definitely, is... Go have children. The speaker is addressing the gold-haired youth and telling him, go have children. Why? Take a wild guess. The gold-haired youth, by the way, is gorgeous. Think Heath Ledger, you know, before he died. Think um, Thor, whatever his name is. I mean, just even men go, it's just not fair that somebody could be that good looking. Okay? I mean, this guy is good looking. But he's not married. So the speaker is saying, go make little use. Meaning these. Why? Because if you don't, you are robbing the world. You are taking the world something you owe it. Your beauty. Your handsomeness. All right. So, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Is Sonnet 18. It's the 18th in the sequence. It's addressed to the gold-haired youth. Okay. So, one comment about Shakespeare's sonnets, and then we'll look at it. A Shakespearean sonnet, also called an English sonnet, has a different structure than. Gerard Manley Hopkins' sonnet. Gerard Manley Hopkins' sonnet was in the Italian or Petrarchan form. After Petrarch, who invented the sonnet form in 13th century Italy. Right? That form had this rhyme, rhyme scheme and stuff as we talked about. In a Shakespearean or English sonnet, you have three quatrains that have the rhyme scheme A, B, B, uh, excuse me, A, B, A, B is the first quatrain, first four lines. The second four lines, C, D, C, D. The third set of lines, E, F, E, F. And then a the final couplet that runs, G, G. Okay? So, for example, look at that first poem. We'll come back to this in just a second. Look at the first one. Day, I'm going to make these rhyme according to our eyes. And they had a different sound in Shakespeare's day. Day, Eight, May, eight. Shines, uh, eins, emd, eins, emd. A, B, A, B, day, eight, A, eight. A, B, A, B, eins, emd, eins, em, C, D, C, D, on down the line, right? So you have those, and then the final couplet. Now, so it's a different structure. Now, Shakespeare will often still include this turn of ideas, this switch of emphasis at the end of line eight. Okay? The final couplet usually is a summation, summary. Almost like you begin it with, therefore. So let's look at, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? 
Thou art more lovely and more temper. See, modern English, that's pronounced temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Eight and it don't rhyme. In Shakespeare's day, both those words rhyme. They would have both been temper eight. Rough or something very close to that. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Let's pause there. So, should I, shall I compare you to a summer's day? Hmm, it's a question. But in order to, I think, understand it kind of from a Shakespeare perspective, we have to understand what a summer day is like. More specifically, a summer day, let's say, late 16th century London. Because a summer day in late 16th century London was not like July or August, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Usually in I've been in London many summers. Usually in London, Temperatures, even in August, upper 70s, low 80s. It's relatively infrequently that you get really hot temperatures. I've been there two times when it's been over 100. It's absolutely unendurable because there's no air conditioning. And they don't know how to make ice, apparently. Um, but Shakespeare's also writing and living during what's called the Little Ice Age. It's not a literal ice age. It is a cooling of the northern hemisphere that lasted for a period of about three or 400 years. From the, I want to say the early 1300s to, or mid 1300s to the mid 1400s. And I mean cooling. There were, there are written accounts, for example, of the Thames being frozen in May. May. So you could have cold days and you could have warming. It's not just one solid period like we think of the Ice Age, right? It has everything to do with the cycles of the sun. So thou art more lovely and more temperate. You're more lovely and you're more temperate than what? A summer's day. Temperate implies what? Louder? Kind of? Moderate. Moderate, even keeled. Because summer, more so in Shakespeare's world than ours, summer, it can be hot one day and it can be cool the next. I've literally been there when it's been 85, 88 degrees one day and 60 and raining the next. Okay? We don't usually have that kind of weather here. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. We don't think of May as summer. May is still spring. They do consider it summer. Why? Because summer is short. It's like May to the end of August. See, we still get hot weather in September, October, sometimes even November. I mean, Murphy's Burroughs had plenty of 90 degree days in November. You don't get 90 degree days in London in November. You're lucky if you get 70 degree days. So rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, those new young flowers, like in the poem, To the Virgins to Make Much of Time, Gather you rosebuds while you may, old time is still flying, the higher he's getting, the sooner they are to dying. And summer's lease has all too short a date. Summer doesn't last long. So Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. The sun is too hot sometimes and often is his gold complexion dim. How do you dim the sun? How? Sunset possibly. That's a permanent, you know, several hours. Clouds. Clouds block the sun. And every fair from fear sometime declines. By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. And that's when the poet introduces the main theme of the poem. Every fair from fair sometime declines. What's meant by fair? Beauty. Every beauty from beauty sometime declines. That is 
Time makes beauty become progressively less beautiful. I mean, fact of life. When are most people, generally speaking, generally speaking, when are most people their best looking? 20s and 30s? Generally, that's what most people say. Personally, I think most women are, they hit their best looks in their 30s, early 40s. I mean, and, and some men, my wife was still, when he died, you know, Sean Connery, he was like 90, bald, wrinkled, she's like still, though. <laughs> he could, <laughs> again, not fair. It does what? It declines. How? What makes that beauty get less and less? By chance, some odd random thing happening, okay? Or nature's changing course, comma, untrimmed. What's nature's changing course? It's Hamlet slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. What can you say about life? Is it ever the same? No. The whole, you know, think of the, the spheres, that whole sublunary idea, everything beneath the motion of the moon is changeable. It's unpermanent. But it's by nature's changing course, untrimmed. I am the present tense. We don't use that verb at all today untrimmed. We use the verb to trim in only two cases, really. No, I'll take that back. There's a few. Several of them are all very much related. You go for a haircut, what might you say? <clears throat> Just to trim. What does that mean? Just take a little bit off. Okay, that's one. Similarly, you can trim the bushes or trees. Usually we would use prune, but it means the same thing. How else do we use the verb to trim? What is a week from yesterday? A week from yesterday. Yesterday was Thursday. A week from that is Thanksgiving. How many of you are having a Thanksgiving meal? Going home, something like that. Okay. What do you have at Thanksgiving? There's a phrase. Turkey and... Anybody know the rest of the phrase? All the trimmings. What are the trimmings? Are those the little pieces of turkey that are cut off? No. It's all the other dishes that kind of surround the turkey. They make up the whole meal. They make it all presentable and desirable. So that's one of those uses. What's the other one? Coming up in about a month? Christmas. What do you do when you get a, what do peop, some people do? If they get a Christmas tree, they trim it. How do you trim the Christmas tree? You don't go out there with a pair of snips and you know, shape it so it's got that perfect conical shape. It's putting the decorations on, putting the lights and all that. And then what do you do when it's time to get rid of the tree? You untrim it. What does nature's changing course do? It removes our decorations. What are our decorations? My hair used to be blonde. I mean, when I was a teenager, blonde, blonde, like yellow blonde. Then it turned brownish, and now it's mostly white. Okay? Well, untrimmed. If I were my brother, you know, my forehead wouldn't end here. <laughs> it is here. Okay? Or if I were one of my uncles, I'd be all for it because he was bald. That's how. You lose hair. You lose your looks. Those, you know, if you think about all those dishes that go around the turkey as kind of accentuating and adding to it and making it all more beautiful, it's removing all that stuff. The nice complexion, the nice tight skin, the nice tight body until you get to be 70 and you're sagging and you've got to have you know, things holding you up everywhere. 
That's the by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. Turn. Big volta. But. Thy eternal summer shall not fade. Your summer doesn't have too short a date. Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. That is, the beauty that you have, you're not going to lose. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. That is, and you're not going to die. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's the shade. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. And there's pun and or irony there. What are the eternal lines? When you're 20, you don't have wrinkles, right? When you're 40, you might have a couple around your eyes. When you're 60, you start to get more. When you're 80, you start to get more. When you're, let's go back to the Old Testament biblical times. When you're 130, 500, you're Methuselah, 969. You're a human walking Sharpe. All you are are wrinkles at that point. That's one idea. What's the other one? Lines of poetry. How do I know? So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, this poem. And this is life to thee. As long as we read this poem, what? The object of this poem is still alive. All right, did not get as far as I needed to. Um, we don't have class on Monday, simply because half of you would show up. And if you like my first class, half of three is not very many. Um, so I just, you know, we're not having class. Uh, just keep reading everything that's on the syllabus for the following Monday. And like I said, I will send out a recording probably for... Everything from my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun through the tiger. That's what I'm going to, whether I have to make a new one or find an old one, that's what I'll send out. All right, have a good